Acts 3, 13 through 15 and 17 through 26. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. 1 John 5, 1-6 Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Christ Jesus, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. The Holy Gospel for the second Sunday of Easter is John 20, 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that has been preserved for us, trustworthy and true. We thank you that as we hear your word, you create faith in us, you give us the ability to believe. And so we pray that as we hear again your word, we will believe in Jesus for eternal life. We ask in his precious name. Amen. John tells us that when Thomas saw Jesus and was invited to put his hands into the holes in his hands and his side from the crucifixion and piercing after. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus asked him this, Have you believed because you have seen me? And then he made this declaration about Thomas and really anyone, all of us who would believe, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then John added this editorial comment or this author's aside. It's not part of the narrative itself of Jesus appearing to his disciples first on the day of the resurrection, and then eight days later. So John, as he wrote the account, concluded with this statement. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Just believe is kind of a popular mantra, a popular saying in the world today, suggesting perhaps that if you just have some kind of trust in something, that good things will happen. Certainly, the concept of belief is central to Scripture, and particularly to our texts today, as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And I would invite us to consider three things that we must believe. That it's not just enough to believe, but that there has to be a focus of belief, that there are things in which, about which, we must believe in order for what John declared to be true, that by believing we may have life in Jesus' name. 
It's not just some kind of random, obscure, or you know, whatever that is, believe, just believe. But it is, first of all, to believe that I am a sinner and need to repent. Secondly, to believe that Jesus forgives my sins and blesses me by turning me from my wickedness. And finally, to believe that his commandments are not burdensome and that by keeping them I overcome the world. Peter's sermon that is our second lesson, or our, our first lesson today, Acts chapter 3, is his second sermon recorded for us. The first sermon that's recorded by Peter was preached on the day of Pentecost, and we don't know how much time there is between the day of Pentecost events and Peter and John going to the temple to worship, where they encountered a lame man. And in Jesus' name, healed him. Those who were at the temple saw this and were amazed and began to wonder about Peter and John, concluding that perhaps there was some kind of magic or some kind of special power or something unique about these men. Oh, well, there is something unique about these men. But as Peter reacted to what was being said about this healing, we have what we what is the second recorded sermon. And as we look at that sermon, we see him focusing on the fact that those in the crowd had been a part of the multitude that had rejected Jesus, that had demanded his crucifixion, but that God had worked through that and had raised Jesus after his crucifixion and death. So the context then of the sermon and of the information of the things that he calls people to as a part of this sermon is the resurrection of Jesus. And so we can't separate the resurrection from this call that we read in verse 19 of Acts 3. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. The call to repentance presumes the need to repent. The call to repentance presumes that we are indeed sinners, that we have rebelled against God, and that we do regularly do things that are contrary to God's will, contrary to God's command. That's what sin is. Essentially, putting ourselves before God, saying that what God has given us is not good enough for us, or not right for us, and that we would rather do things our own way. In essence, it's a failure to believe. A failure, failure to believe that God is good. A failure to believe that God has given us boundaries. A failure to believe that Jesus came as a solution to this problem that we have. But it begins by a belief that we are sinners. Jesus emphasizes this for us when he told the disciples that he was sending them to be forgivers of sin. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Again, if forgiveness is needed, then a violation has been committed, a trespass, a sin, a rebellion. If we need to be forgiven, it's because we have done something wrong. We've broken trust, essentially. And then we go back again to Peter's sermon. The last verse that we read of it today reminds us of this same thing, that we are indeed wicked. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first 
to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And so again, we are confronted with our wickedness, our failure to trust that what God has given us is good, our failure to trust that what God has given us is enough, and our failure to do what God commands to do, or our failure to not do what God commands us to do. I believe that I am a sinner, and that if I am to be right with God, I need to repent. And yes, I need to repent that first time in my life, but I also need this to be something continual. continual. Because although my old nature was put to death in my baptism, that old nature, as Luther is said to have spoken, is a good swimmer. And he does battle against me daily. And I do sin daily. And I need to repent daily. I need to believe that I am a sinner and need to repent. Fortunately, I'm not stuck there, though, because I also get to believe that Jesus forgives my sins and blesses me by turning me from my wickedness. Again, we look at the Gospel this morning, John 20, verses 21 and, 20, and 23, so I've skipped 22 there, but verse 21, Jesus tells the disciples that as the Father sent him, he is also sending his disciples. And then the command, or the declaration, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Those are put together in a line, in a context. So when Jesus sent his disciples to declare forgiveness, it was in mirror, it was an extension of what Jesus had been sent to do. If Jesus sent his disciples to forgive, it was because that's what the Father sent Jesus to do. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And so I see there this beautiful promise that I can trust, that I can believe, that Jesus does indeed forgive sins, and that then he extends that declaration to his people, to others. So that in essence, the disciples of Christ, we the disciples of Christ, become his mouthpiece to the world declaring to them what he came to do, to forgive sins. John states it a little differently in his letter, his first letter, chapter 5, verse 1, we read, anyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And so this is really an explanation, a description a definition of what it means to be forgiven. If we believe in Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the one that God sent to be our King, the Christ, then we have new birth from God. And if we have new birth from God, that means that the old died so that there could be new. If we have been born of God by believing that Jesus is the Christ, in order for that to happen, the old nature had to die. And the old nature had to, has to die because the old nature is a sinner and sinful. And so we see this 
promise that when we put our faith in Jesus, believing that he is the one that God sent to be our king, and that he was actually crowned with a crown of thorns and enthroned on the cross of Calvary, and proven victorious by his resurrection, then our old nature is put to death and a new nature is born. And then again, we go to that last verse in, that we read from Peter's sermon in Acts 3, verse 26. We looked first at the wickedness that is declared there, but there's a promise that precedes that. That God, and again this is tied to the resurrection, that God having raised up his servant, sent him to you. Why? To bless you by turning you away from your wickedness. So the forgiveness of sin results in this great blessing that turns us away from our rebellion, from our sin, from our wickedness. So I believe that I am a sinner, and I need to repent, and that when I repent, Jesus does forgive my sin and blesses me by placing a new creation in me, or making me a new creation. I am born of God. I am a new creation. And this new creation then does not want to sin. And so yes, we experience regularly this battle. Because the new nature does not want to sin, the old nature wants to continue sinning, and we need to rely on Jesus, on God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit to strengthen us and to lead us to the third thing that we ought to believe, that His commandments are not burdensome, and that in obedience there is victory over the world. Now we have to be careful here that we don't put this obedience to the commandments first. Yes, our disobedience to the commandments is what destroyed our fellowship with God. But we cannot come back into fellowship by obedience. We come back into fellowship only through forgiveness. And forgiveness is ours only when we believe. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So now that we have been born of God, now that we are a new creation, we have a completely new outlook on reality. A completely new outlook on life. The first part of verse 3 of 1 John chapter 5 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And so, this new nature, this new creation, shows its love for God by obedience. It doesn't try to get God to love by obedience, but it shows that we love God because we obey. We keep His commandments. And the second part of that same verse then reminds us that His commandments are not burdensome. If we think that what God calls us to do and the way that God calls us to live is a burden, that's the problem. And we go back to the beginning and we need to believe that we are sinners and need to repent. But the new nature looks at God's law and loves it as it loves God. And it recognizes that Obedience to the commandments is not a burden. It's not a chore. It's not a difficulty. It's not something against which we ought to rebel. And in the context then of that statement, 
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The next verse, verse 4, says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And so we are recognizing that we do have victory over the temptations. We do have victory over here the world is that which, is, that which stands against God. We have victory. Because by faith, we have been made new, and the new us loves God and loves His commandments. And loves to do His commandments, because they are not burdensome. Now Jesus did many other, thing, many other signs in the presence of His disciples. The greatest of the signs is the death and resurrection which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Father, we thank You for the forgiveness of sin, and we pray that we would be aware of our rebellion and confess it regularly to you, knowing that in your love and mercy we are forgiven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross and by the power of his resurrection we are forgiven. And so then, help us to live the new life to which you call us being reminded that your commandment is not burdensome, and that by faith we are yours, a new creation that loves you and your word. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.